People create human farms where they raise cloned children to use their organs. Main character of the movie, young girl Katie, attended a closed type boarding school called Hailsham. Good morning, students. Good morning, Miss Emily. Every morning, the students gathered in the hall to greet the boarding school director, Miss Emily. One day, the headmistress found cigarette butts in the schoolyard and strictly forbade the children from smoking. That it is much, much worse for a student of Hailsham to smoke cigarettes than anyone else. The children still don't suspect the horrible purpose for which the director is so concerned about their health. What's your opinion on smoking? Write your thoughts in the comments. After breakfast, Katie and her best friend Ruth go for a walk in the meadow. The girls chat carelessly and suddenly notice a new caregiver, Miss Lucy. We haven't had a new guardian for ages. The woman immediately starts her duties and watches over the students in the yard. The children are playing with a ball. Suddenly, the ball flies over the fence, but a boy named Tommy doesn't attempt to retrieve it. On the contrary, he runs away from the fence in terror. Miss Lucy finds this strange. She asks the girls why Tommy didn't go after the ball. Wait, don't cross the boundary, Miss Lucy. It's too dangerous. The teachers at Hallisham somehow instill in the children the belief that they won't survive beyond the fence. Miss Lucy decides to find out who is scaring the students and why. The woman has no idea that she has joined a very peculiar boarding school. During the art class, Tommy doesn't make any progress. Other children mock his drawing, and only Katie refrains from teasing him. She feels sorry for Tommy. Have you ever experienced bullying during your school years? After classes, the children run back to the yard. The boys continue to taunt Tommy and exclude him from their football team. Abandoned, Tommy has a breakdown from hurt and loneliness. Compassionate Katie can't just watch it and wants to comfort the boy, but he accidentally hits her hand, leaving a bruise. During the medical examination, Katie doesn't admit that the bruise was caused by Tommy's hit. During lunch, the girl sits next to the outcast and is the only one trying to support him. Tommy is very grateful for this and immediately apologizes for the accidental hit. Warm feelings develop between the kids, and they go for a walk together. The next day, under Miss Lucy's supervision, the students pretend to go to a cafe. Tommy feels insecure even in the game, but Katie and Miss Lucy support him. This gives the boy hope that he can be loved and accepted. At night, when everyone is asleep, Ruth and Katie gossip about their classmates. Ruth notices. Tommy's changed. Changed out. Katie tries to hide from her friend that she has started falling in love with Tommy, but it seems that Ruth herself has something to conceal. Soon, a joyful event takes place at Hailsham. Madame Marie Claw, the director of the children's art gallery, arrives. She will review the students' drawings and poems from the boarding school and select the best ones for her gallery. Every student dreams of having their work chosen. The next day, a variety of trinkets are brought to the boarding school. The children can buy something with tokens they receive for good behavior during their studies. The toys look worn out, but the residents of Hallisham are happy about it because it's their only connection to the outside world. Katie doesn't find a trinket to her liking and sits sadly in the corridor. Cheerful Tommy rushes up to her and presents her with a cassette of songs he just bought. Katie is touched by his gift. Thank you. Sitting in her room, Katie enjoys the music. It contains songs about love, and the girl dreams about Tommy. Ruth notices her in this state and guesses her friend's feelings, but Katie has no idea how cunning Ruth will be towards her. The next day, the class comes to Miss Lucy's lesson. She has discovered the terrible truth about this boarding school and wants to tell it to her students. Miss Lucy says that all people can determine their own destiny, except for the children of Hailsham. Their fate is predetermined. You will start to donate your vital organs. That's what you're created to do. This will happen before the kids reach middle age. After the fourth extraction, their lives will end. Miss Lucy informs the children about this so that they know about themselves and can live their short lives with dignity. Silence fills the classroom as the students are shocked by this news. However, the children still don't realize why they have to sacrifice themselves for the sake of others. Soon, Miss Lucy is dismissed from Hailsham. Director Miss Emily doesn't deny that she raises children for these purposes, but she refuses to discuss it with them directly. During Miss Emily's speech, Katie notices that Tommy and Ruth are holding hands. Overwhelmed by hurt and confusion, Katie swallows her tears. Now Katie is more concerned about Tommy and Ruth's relationship than her own dreadful fate. While spying on the two, Katie witnesses their kiss. She doesn't understand why, after so much teasing, 
Rufus suddenly has feelings for Tommy. Several years pass. Throughout this time, Katie hoped that the couple in love would soon break up. But the time for graduation from Halisham has come, and Tommy and Ruth are still together. We were moved from Halisham at 18. Former students are resettled in special settlements where they must await their fate as organ donors. Katie, Tommy, and Ruth are sent to a settlement called Cottages. The young adults are obligated to live there, but can take trips to neighboring cities. But why don't they try to escape? In the cottages, adolescents get to know graduates from other boarding schools. It turns out there are many of them in the country. Among the residents of the cottages, there are couples in love. For example, Rodney and Chrissy, who are soon to be sent to the donor center. In the meantime, they try to find joy in life as much as possible. Katie occasionally takes walks in the forest. Tommy joins her. They enjoy spending time together. Ruth knows about it and tries in every way to show that Tommy belongs to her. At the same time, she also wants to hurt Katie. So that's what this is about. It must be really awful for you, surrounded by all these couples. Katie tries to deny it, but she truly yearns for intimacy. One day, she finds adult magazines in the trash and flips through them. Tommy catches her doing this, but she is not embarrassed. She just sarcastically asks him to pass the magazines to Ruth for their enrichment. Despite all the difficulties, Katie and Ruth remain friends. One day, Ruth asks Katie to accompany her and the rest of the group to a neighboring city. They had been there before and saw a girl who looked very similar to Ruth. The donors realize that they are mere clones of real people. That's why they are raised as organ donors, to take care of the real people and prolong their lives. However, it seems that clones are no different from humans, except for the way they came into existence. Clones still have warmth and interest in their originals, so they decide to go to the neighboring city to find the original Ruth. First, the group goes to a cafe where they can finally talk without being overheard. Rodney and Chrissy ask a question that has been bothering them for a long time. They heard that graduates of Halisham receive certain leniencies. For example, if a couple in love from Halisham can prove the sincerity of their feelings, then they would be given a few years together before they began their donations. This means that for three to four years, they are left in peace and allowed to live a normal life without extractions. Rodney and Chrissy dream of submitting such an application and live in hope that it's possible. The friends from Halsham haven't heard anything about deferment and have to disappoint the couple. Rodney and Chrissy find it hard to hold back tears of despair. Then the friends set out to find the original Ruth. They secretly observe her, but they don't see any significant resemblance and walk away. Afterward, Ruth becomes furious. She doesn't believe that clones are made from successful people. We are modeled on trash. Junkies, prostitutes, winos, tramps. This is deliberately done so that it's not so pitiful to use clones for organ donations. In a fit of hysteria, Ruth runs away from the group. Katie also becomes saddened, and she tries to calm herself down while gazing at the sea. Tommy joins her, and the two feel a strong connection again. They sit silently side by side on the pier, contemplating life. In the evening, the group returns to the cottages. At the entrance, each of them places a bracelet on their wrist against the scanner. It's a mandatory procedure during movement to make it easier for people to keep track of the clones. At home, Ruth yells at Tommy for staying with Katie instead of going to find her. Tommy has nothing to say in response. The next day, he goes for a walk in the forest with Katie and discusses deferment for couples. Tommy believes that their artwork and poems from Halsham were sent to Madame Marie Claude's gallery for a purpose. After all, creativity can reveal a lot about a person's feelings. Perhaps it's through their artwork that the couple can prove the sincerity of their love and receive a deferment. Are you thinking of applying with Ruth? But Tommy can't submit an application at all because his works were never chosen for the gallery since he was not very good at drawings. Katie doesn't understand any more who Tommy is in love with, what he wants, and if there's a way out of this situation. At night, Tommy and Ruth engage in private activities, and the sounds shake the entire house. To avoid hearing it, Katie listens to the cassette tape that Tommy once gave her through headphones. In the middle of the night, Ruth enters her room. She declares that Tommy loves Katie only as a friend and nothing more. Tommy even told Ruth about Katie flipping through adult magazines, and the couple had a good laugh about it. This deeply hurts Katie, and she no longer wants to live near her former friends. Katie decides to become a helper for donors who will undergo organ extraction soon. Her job is to stay with the clones until the end and provide them with moral support. However, this doesn't exempt Katie herself from being a donor. By becoming a helper, 
she leaves the cottages. Soon, Katie learns that Tommy and Ruth have broken up but chooses not to maintain contact with them. Little does she know what awaits them in the future. If I'd known, maybe I'd have kept tighter hold of them. Ten years pass and Katie lives in a separate apartment, continuing her work as a helper, but hasn't become a donor of herself yet. She has almost forgotten about Tommy and Ruth, fully devoting herself to her job. Katie visits the hospital and supports a donor girl before another extraction. The donor couldn't survive the operation, and Katie can barely find the strength not to show her grief. She converses with a woman from the registry and unexpectedly sees Ruth's medical record on her computer screen. Ruth has already undergone two extractions. Currently, Ruth's health is deteriorating, and she won't live for long. You think she'll complete on the third? I think she wants to complete. Katie decides to visit her long unseen friend, Ruth. Ruth is indeed not in good shape, but she is happy to see Katie. She also reveals that Tommy has had two extractions but is doing well. Ruth genuinely wants to complete her donations as soon as possible because otherwise, artificial life support will be maintained and her organs will continue to be taken. Katie tries to support her friend and stays with her for several days. Ruth starts feeling better and expresses a desire to visit a beautiful place. Katie is ready to accompany her. I mean, if we're driving all that way, we could call in on Tommy. The girls arrive at Tommy's place and are almost in tears of joy. Tommy is also happy to see them and warmly embraces Katie first and then Ruth. The trio gets into the car and heads to the picturesque seaside. On the way, Tommy explains that Halsham has been closed, and now there are only incubator-like institutions left for cloned children. Nobody cares about a child's feelings there. During their conversation, the friends reach the coastline. Tension emanates from Ruth. Suddenly, she says, I'd like you to forgive me. Ruth admits that she interfered with Tommy and Katie's love. She'd always knew that they should be together. She was simply envious of their love and didn't want to be left alone. She considers her actions terrible and wants to make amends. She managed to find Madame Marie Claude's address. Now Tommy and Katie can go to her and request a deferral. The lovers find hope. Over the years, Tommy has learned to draw and now shows Katie his artwork. She is thrilled with his drawings. At night, the couple is left alone. Katie reads a book to Tommy and then sits beside him on the bed. They kiss for the first time. They have been waiting for this moment their entire lives, and now they are finally happy. Katie finds Madame Marie Claude's house, and she and Tommy plan to visit her soon to ask for a deferral. Katie honestly informs Ruth of their decision. Ruth is happy, but not wholeheartedly. She remains completely alone and doesn't anticipate the upcoming extraction. Doctors disconnect her from the machines without sentimentalism and don't even attempt to empathize with her. Soon, Tommy and Katie arrive at Madame Marie Claude's house. I brought you some things. Some things you might like for your gallery. Madame invites them into her house. Tommy tenderly confesses their love to her. Then he shares his speculation about the way to obtain a deferral and shows his artwork to Madame Marie Claude. She looks at the young couple with pain and tenderness and admires Tommy's drawings, but cannot say anything comforting. Former Halsham director, Miss Emily, comes to her aid. She also lives in the same house and explains that the student's artwork was displayed in galleries to show society that donor children are also beings with feelings and souls. Miss Emily worried about the ethics of donation, although she understood that society could not return to the times when organ extraction from clones was considered unacceptable. There are no deferrals, and they never have been. The gallery was not intended to delve into the clone's souls, but to find out if they had souls. Tommy and Katie's hopes are shattered by this revelation. Tommy falls into despair and doesn't even say goodbye to Madame. In the evening, the lovers return to the hospital, and on the way, Tommy has a nervous breakdown. He gets out of the car and screams in agony and painting for the whole world to hear. Katie can barely calm him down. The day of Tommy's third extraction arrives. Katie bets him farewell with love and tenderness through the glass. Smiling at her for the last time, Tommy falls asleep under anesthesia. Katie's entire life flashes before her eyes. Soon, Tommy departs from this world. Katie learns that she will undergo her first extraction in a month. She visits the place where Halsham used to be and dreams of seeing Tommy's ghost, calling her to join him. That is her only dream. What I'm not sure about is if our lives have been so different from the lives of the people we save. Clones, like humans, want to live on Earth as long as possible for love and joy. What do you think? Will humanity reach the point of growing clones for organ harvesting? And how humane is that? Share your opinion in the comments. We will feature the best ones in our next video. Here's the best comment from the previous one. See you soon.